Yeah. Okay. Let's start. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, on behalf of the Brazil-China Business Council, I am glad to announce today's event, which is a joint venture with uh, Brazilian Center for International Relations, SABRI, Fernando Henrique Cardoso Foundation, FHC, and Jazeera Media, member of the Eurasia Group. We are very honored to have Ian Bremer, founder and president of Eurasia Group, as our guest speaker. Ian will be joined by Christopher Gauman, Executive Director for the Americas of Eurasia. I would be somewhat pretentious if I were to introduce Ian Bremer, one of the world's leading political scientists. I have found, however, a brief and appropriate description in the Eurasia webpage, namely, and I quote, Ian Bremer is a political scientist who helps business leaders, policymakers, and the general public make sense around them. Ian is an independent voice on critical issues around the globe, offering clear-headed insights through speeches, written commentary, and even satirical puppets, really. I remember when I once visited him in New York, I saw what I first thought was a character of the Muppet Show series. On a closer examination, I found it was actually Ian who later told me that he, it was given to him by the author of The Muppet Show. Well, our subject today is COVID-19, the geopolitical recession and Brazil perspectives. We are witnessing an accelerated transition to a new and still undefined international order. Landmarks of this transition are well known. The end of the Cold War, of the Berlin Wall, the dissolution of the Soviet Union, and the reunification of Germany. Then we have the 90s, the decade of the end of history, marked by the perception of an undeniable leadership of the United States, which paved the way for further improving the international multilateral system of its own inspiration, with the creation of WTO, the NPT expansion becoming more comprehensive, uh, then we had 9-11, which made explicit the vulnerabilities and limits of the superpower might, and the clear perception of China's rise and its consequence on the center of gravity of power. The U.S. now is now attempting to dismantle the multilateral system it created. Then we have the th themes on the order of the day, Globalism, globalization, coronavirus, instability. Well, where are we going to? Is the coronavirus a game changer or simply a catalyst of changes which are already taking place? Well, those are the questions we hope to deal with with Ian and Chris. Ian, you have the floor and thank you very much in advance. Uh, thank you, my friend. Uh, when I got the note from you, uh, I was delighted uh, to put this together. Uh, there's a long history of uh, robust cooperation between our various organizations, and I have a lot of like and, uh, and respect both for you and for all of your colleagues on. So welcome to everyone. I'm not surprised we have so many folks live streaming right now. Also, you'll notice my friend and partner in crime, Chris Garman, who is a uh, He's beaming in from an undisclosed location. Uh, we, never, we never let him know, people know where he is exactly. That's why there's just a white background. We don't want any identifying, um, you know, sort of uh, 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 pieces that, that, uh, that, that would allow you uh, to get a beat on the guy. We always have to be separate. That's, you know, it's a challenging global order. Uh, no, but more, more serious, actually less seriously, just for a second before we come more serious. Less seriously is how much I have to appreciate Brazil. Um, because, of course, you know, I mean, the United States, uh, we've had our problems of late. We like to tell everyone that we're the leader of the world, American exceptionalism. We have the best values, the best political system, the best free market. Everyone should do what we say. We should make the world safe for democracy. We've got the best military. And the last few years in particular have been difficult for that, right? I mean, the U.S. not, not living up to its own values. And of course, there's always hypocrisy. I mean, you go back to things like Vietnam, you go back to American neo-colonialism and our experience in Central America and in Chile and other places that you can make those points. But more recently, with the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, with the 2008 financial crisis, 
um, with the election of Donald Trump. I mean, there have just been a lot of things that have made it harder for flag-waving Americans to say that everyone else should aspire to be like us. And, and in that regard, the fact that you in Brazil have a political leadership which is even more robustly incompetent than that that we have in the United States right now, that you have surpassed the United States in uh, daily deaths and coronavirus and daily cases, even though your population is smaller, that you are facing a profound political scandal and crisis on the back of the impeachment and Lava Jato scandal, and we thought you got it behind you, and now it's coming again. I mean, when I look around the world, and I get a little down that the United States isn't who we were when we beat the Soviets in the Cold War because our ideas were better. And I love Brazil, and you know we have offices there, and I love the Brazilian people, and it's a fantastic place to be, but your political system is god-awful. And, um, and, and, and I, again, I feel like we can now be partners in a deeper way as we experience this profound dysfunction together. We shouldn't, I mean, everyone says America first means America alone, but why can't America first be America and Brazil together alone? I think that this is something that we should, we should really try to, uh, to work together to create some fraternity among the politically disaffected in our two great democracies. So um, that was a little bit of tongue in cheek, but of course, like any good satire, an awful lot of truth, I think, found in it. Um, now, maybe before I turn it over to Chris, a little bit of seriousness about where I see the world going. Uh, to start, if we want to assess how the Americans are doing right now, it is really important not just to look at President Trump and his tweets, because they will distract you. They will make you feel like the United States is heading to civil war or authoritarianism that it's all over, that no one listens to America anymore. I mean, just today, Trump says he's going to have a G11 instead of a G7, and he's inviting the South Koreans, the Indians, the Australians, and the Russians to come and meet. And of course, Trudeau and Merkel and Boris Johnson quickly say, actually, no, we're not gonna do that. We don't want the Russians to come. And it's kind of like when Trump says over the weekend that he's gonna label it's going to designate Antifa a terrorist organization. He has no power to actually do that. But for a day, everyone goes, oh, my God, he's going to do this. And then he says, I'm going to leave the World Health Organization, which is embarrassing in the middle of a pandemic. But actually, you can't leave unless you pay the arrears that we owe, which we're not about to do. And if he actually starts the process, it's a year before he can leave, which means we have the elections first. So like so many things, like the wall we were gonna build that Trump was gonna pay for, secret, we already have a wall. I think we've added a few miles. There are some fencing elements. The Mexicans are not paying for it. There's a lot of rhetoric. There's a lot of incompetence. There's not a lot of there there. Um, if you look at where the there there is, Trump acts a lot like a lot of others who are in his party. He has uh, reduced regulatory authority. He's elected a lot of conservative judges. He's uh, put in place, appointed, he's put in place a Fed chair who's very much in line with previous Fed chairs. Um, he's not draining the swamp. He has a cabinet that is enormously oriented towards the private sector and wealthy special interests. He's reduced taxes on the wealthy um, and on big business. So, uh, you know, if I look at the response to coronavirus, I can spend all of my time talking about how personally unfit Trump is and how I wouldn't want my kids to be raised by someone like him, but that's not useful. Or I can talk about how the United States is actually doing. And how the United States is actually doing is we were very late to address the reality of coronavirus after we found out that it was coming. The Chinese lied about it, they covered it up for a month. Then the rest of the world and the Chinese people found out about it. We responded late. We did put travel restrictions on non-permanent residents and citizens coming from China quickly. So did the Australians, so did the Italians. 
The South Koreans and Japanese did not. That hurt them. That was a smart move by Trump. But he was a cheerleader. No worries, no problems. We'll take care of it. And as a consequence, he didn't move to address ensuring that we had resilience to pandemics. And that meant that we didn't have the case, we didn't have the test cases. We weren't able to get tests that worked. The Germans were way in front of us. The South Koreans were way in front of us. And we weren't able to quarantine as quickly as we might have. And that led to a bigger expansion of outbreaks than we should have had. Now, by the way, that's not just Trump's problem. That was also the problem of a lot of governors locally. Washington State did a really good job when they had their first initial outbreak in an old folks home. But in New York, we did not. And as a consequence, 50% of the people dead in New York State and New York City are in old age homes. And you can't blame Trump for that. So I would say that on the healthcare response and on the general pandemic response of testing and quarantine and contact tracing, I'd give the United States negative grades. Not failing grades, but negative grades. Not North and Italy grades, not Brazil grades, but failing grades. Say, C minus D. On the economic side, I'd give the United States high grades. Everyone I talk to in the US that knows something about economics, every Democrat, Jack Lew, Larry Summers, Jason Furman, I've spoken to all of them in the last couple of weeks, they've each told me separately what an amazing job Jay Powell has done as Fed chair. Trump appointee, fantastic, world class, and the US markets have done well as a consequence of that. We've also been fast and big and bipartisan on the economic side from Mnuchin, our Secretary of Treasury, as well as Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House. They don't like each other, but they got it done. Over 10% of GDP, the whole economy. And we expect that there will be yet another tranche to probably extend unemployment benefits to help with bailouts of companies under bankruptcy threat, both large, medium, and small in the coming months. Will it be enough as we get close to November? I think no. So right now I would give the US strong marks on domestic economic response, better than almost any other major advanced industrial economy, uh, but I tending in a weaker direction. Look at how the Americans have been affected so far, both economic effects, and healthcare effects, and you'd say about what you see in Europe. The US economy is performing a little better than Europe. This year will perform a little better than Europe. Um, per capita deaths right now a little better than Europe probably will end up a little worse because we're about 10 days behind in terms of where the peak was and is um, in various American states from when the coronavirus hit Europe. And you shouldn't compare the US to Germany or just Italy. You should compare the US to the EU and the UK then you get roughly commensurate economic size, roughly commensurate population size. There you'd say the Americans a little better economically, a little worse on the, uh, on the mortality and, and caseload. On the society side is where the United States is of course failing. That's where you see this massive inequality, much bigger in the US than in Europe, and also massive racial inequality in the United States. And that is playing out very badly indeed in my city, in New York City, and I'm hearing it right now, massive protests just a few blocks outside of where I sit right now. Over the last three months, all I've been hearing are ambulances every day, every night. Now I'm not hearing as many ambulances because there aren't as many people dying. Instead, I'm hearing police sirens all day, all night. I'm hearing helicopters all day, all night. I won't hear helicopters tonight because there's a damn curfew in New York City starting at 11 p.m. It's a city that never sleeps and we're gonna be sleeping tonight. And that's happening in LA, it's happening in Chicago, it's happening in Minneapolis, it's happening in Florida, it's happening in Detroit, it's happening in New Orleans, it's happening in Philadelphia and Boston. In almost every major urban center today, there is a race divide that is so painful, it is so deep. So many more black Americans are dying of coronavirus than whites. So many more blacks have existing conditions and no access to proper health care. So many more blacks have been incarcerated. So many more blacks have been abused by police. So many more blacks do not have the opportunity to get proper education. So many more blacks feel disenfranchised that the system is fundamentally rigged against them. And so when they see what happened to George Floyd, 
in Minneapolis on Memorial Day just one week ago, and nothing happens to these officers. They do not get charged for murder. They do not get charged for crimes until after days of demonstrations and violent protests. What are you going to do? And of course, this is also going to be exacerbated by social media, by polarization, and yes, even by external sources. So on that front, the Americans are deeply broken today and not getting fixed anytime soon. I had hoped that President Trump would not have a crisis of significant scale on his watch. Not only does he have a crisis, he has the worst crisis of our lifetimes. And surprise, surprise, he's not responding to it by unifying the country, he's further dividing the country. Um, final point, which is that coming out of this crisis, um, if you give the Americans good marks on the economy, negative marks on the healthcare side, and negative marks on the social side, you should also give the Americans good marks on the geopolitical power that they will have coming out of this crisis. This is very important and underappreciated because the only winners, there are no country winners from coronavirus. Everyone does worse as a consequence of this crisis. But some countries don't do as badly as other countries. And the big winners are the tech companies. They're the companies that allow us to have a couple thousand people that we're talking to right now between Brazil and the United States. They're the ones that allow the knowledge economy to continue to function while the bricks and mortar and the real economy takes it on the chin. And the Americans dominate that field compared to our allies. We have all those companies. The Europeans don't, the Canadians don't, the Japanese don't, the South Koreans don't, the Brazilians don't. And that, that is gonna be a very, very important uh, area of American strength. Uh, you know, the one thing that you can say coming off of coronavirus and coming out of riots is more surveillance, less privacy, more big data, more deep learning, stronger monopolies among those American companies. The only companies that compete are the Chinese and they will not be allowed to compete in the American or advanced industrial democracy space because of the tech cold war with the Americans. So I think the Americans will come out of this crisis on that front stronger than their allies. I also think the role of the US dollar will be stronger as a global reserve currency than it was before. People will not feel as confident about the Euro or about the pound sterling or about the yen. I feel like America's export of energy and food in a world where the global supply chain is breaking down and localizing becomes a bigger advantage for the Americans, not a disadvantage. So if you look at all of the ways that power are, is playing out around the world, at the same time that the Americans are losing the ability to lead by example, and multilateralism is weakening, no G7, no G11 instead of G0, you see that the United States actually is asymmetrically going to play more unilaterally, even if Biden becomes the next president, and that's significant. So anyway, that's 15 minutes for me to kick this thing off, hopefully provocative and interesting. Again, uh, welcome to all of you here, and let me turn it over to my friend in an undisclosed location. We do not know where he is, but we know who he is, Chris Garman. Thank you, thank you very much, Ian. And I will keep my location undisclosed. Uh, for the for the for the purposes of my own security, <laughs> um, but uh, but uh, again, I want to be able to thank um, you know um, the invitation to participate uh, in this debate. It's a tremendous pleasure uh, to uh, to uh, to be in such a, a high quality conversation, in such an opportune moment. Um, I'll kind of evidently I'm going to kind of give a little bit of a perspective of how we're seeing events in Brazil, but I'd like to begin with a a comparative reflection, uh, looking at the types of leaders that are faring better from a public opinion point of view um, in COVID-19 in comparison to the leaders that aren't faring as well. Right? Uh, and there is a pattern um, that when we look at kind of, um, you know, the response of leaders and how the public have reacted to, to, um, to policies enacted by the administrations. When we look across the board, both in industrialized economies and emerging market alike, and we are seeing a pretty significant rally around the flag effect. You look at a, a number of different leaders are seeing their approval ratings, you know, rise out of COVID-19, anywhere from five, 10, 20 percentage points. Um, and usually these are the leaders that have enacted uh, stronger measures uh, to tackle a public health crisis in a context where the public is very scared uh, of their own safety um, with this global pandemic. 
Uh, we have another crop of leaders, however, who haven't fared as well, haven't really benefited uh, from, uh, from a, a rally around the flag effect. Uh, we certainly can put uh, Jair Bolsonaro in that camp, who has his approval ratings drop a bit. I think we put uh, you know, Manuel Lopez Obrador within that, that, uh, that category. We put Donald Trump uh, within that category. He had a little bit of a rally around the flag effect, went back to where he was in pre-COVID levels. Maybe Duterte, Erdogan, Putin. What's interesting is, is that leaders who had very strong anti-system, anti-establishment credentials uh, coming into COVID-19 are performing more poorly in comparison to leaders who have uh, at least the traditional establishment credentials. Right? We have to remember that we came into this environment with deep levels of distrust towards public institutions, institutions like the media, the judiciary, political parties. Look at the public opinion polls, the level of disenchantment with the systems, uh, uh, you know, broadly speaking, was very, very high uh, in continental Europe, United States, and much of Latin America. We had a crop of leaders who were elected uh, with very strong anti-system, anti-establishment credentials. But it is precisely those leaders who are performing more poorly on a relative basis because their instincts, when faced with a political crisis or a pandemic crisis, is to fight your way out of a corner. Right? Um, and so when we look at kind of the reaction function uh, of Jair Bolsonaro, who, who in the middle of this pandemic, uh, you know, his initial response was to criticize judiciary, criticize governors, criticize party leaders, um, kind of fight his way out of a corner. That was the script that was successful that led him to be elected in office in the first place. That was the script that was successful when governing, but it was a script that hasn't necessarily um, done him much favor in the middle of this crisis. But, but we're seeing this type of pattern uh, more broadly. Right? I think well, that's, that's interesting to call into attention. Now, uh, that said, uh, looking at Brazil uh, more specifically, uh, it's certainly, uh, uh, you know, the headlines coming out of Brazil couldn't be worse. Uh, we have a not only a public health crisis, uh, which doesn't look to be, um, you know, uh, close to to uh, coming under control. Uh, we have a president um, who has been blasting uh, governors for measures of social isolation, uh, fighting his way in a context where he has been uh, tremendously isolated politically. Uh, we have a political scandal uh, brewing around the president's inner circle that led to the exit of, uh, of uh, uh, former Minister of Justice Sergio Moro, all about you know, the president's desire to be able to control the federal police. Uh, and over the past couple of weeks, we have a, a brewing and deepening institutional crisis uh, between uh, the, the, the federal Supreme Court on the one hand and the administration on the other. What's likely to come of this environment? Uh, two broad comments that I'd like to make to, for us to be able to have time to to, uh, to discuss uh, in Q&A. The first is, I think we're headed towards a, an, an environment in Brazil of a deep polarization um, of, of kind of political forces, uh, but probably not an environment in which the president loses his mandate, and probably not an environment in where we're gonna have uh, an institutional rupture uh, and kind of a breakdown of the democratic order. Um, you know, first, uh, what really um, calls, you know, at least stands out when looking at the environment in Brazil is that, yes, uh, President Bolsonaro, um, you know, has isolated himself. Um, you look at, you know, his, the media is, is blasting him. Governors and mayors stood in opposition towards him. The courts are standing in opposition to him, towards him. But if you look at public opinion polls, uh, you know, his base of support has shown to be reasonably resilient. Um, you know, entering into COVID-19, uh, the president's base of support measured on a five-point scale. If you, if you identify and you say, do you appraise the president to have a very excellent, good, regular, uh, bad, or horrible uh, assessment of the administration? A lot of Brazilian pollsters measure government approval ratings on a, on a five-point scale rather than the traditional binary approve or disapprove of a president. So the president's approval ratings on a five-point scale, the excellent good rating prior to COVID-19 Ranged from anywhere from 30% to 36% uh, excellent good ratings. Um, now, uh, you know, three months into COVID-19, his excellent good ratings have ranged from 26 uh, to 32 uh, percentage points. In other words, he's dropped on average about close to five percentage points within his his base of support. Um, his negatives have gone up, and his regulars have uh, have diminished, um, but it isn't a significant drop. And let me translate these numbers right, on a binary scale. We've had two polls that have, were released uh, over this past week, Datafolia 
and she's paid PESB. That the four years of approval ratings on excellent good were 33%, the regular at 22, the negatives uh, at 43. For you to translate that number into an approved, disapproved um, rating, right? The, the information or the quick shortcut is you get the Higgle Lab, the regular, and you divide it in half. So an excellent good rating of 33 and a regular of 22 translates to an approval rating of 43%, right? And a, and, a, and a disapproval rating of 54%. Exactly the same numbers that Donald Trump has in the United States. You get the, the She's Pay PASB poll, he has an approval rating of excellent good 26, regular 23, and a negative 49. So there you have a 37% approval rating and a 60% negative rating, right? These are not the levels of public support which are consistent with the president being removed from office. In order to be able to remove the president from office, you need two thirds support in the lower house, uh, either for an impeachment or to approve a motion uh, to be investigated in the federal Supreme Court. And I'll tell you that all the party leaders that we spoke, that we're speaking to in Congress, there is no appetite to remove the president in the middle of a pandemic. And Congress is very afraid of the public opinion backlash to moving against the president more broadly, right? In other words, the point is the president's pool ratings have to drop a heck of a lot more before we get into that type of environment. And I think that this speaks to kind of the, the nature of polarized politics uh, that we're living in Brazil. We have a society that, that was already polarized entering into COVID-19 and probably coming out of COVID-19 will be even more deeply entrenched uh, in, in, in a polarized environment. Uh, the, you know, this is a president that will probably come out weakened. Uh, we do think that the specter of impeachment will hang over this, the head of the president over the second half of the year. Uh, investigations against, against the president will continue. They will not abate anytime soon. And, and probably the president's support will drop a bit more. Uh, but we have to remember that this is still a president that does appeal to a segment of, 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 the, of the population uh, that, uh, that doesn't believe and, and has tremendous discredit with these institutions. And his narrative does resonate within a segment of, uh, of, of society. The big question mark, I think, politically for the president uh, may very well rest in the pandemic itself. Right? I think that's probably the biggest challenge that the president faces. Um, uh, that if the pandemic deteriorates meaningfully in large urban centers, metropolitan centers in Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo and parts of the Southeast, that could potentially lead to a drop of support, but more likely is that some of his core base of support is not going to abandon him. And to the extent that his core base of support doesn't abandon him, not only will Congress think twice about moving towards impeachment against the president, uh, but also the institutional crisis between the courts on the one hand and the executive on the other will also hold some certain bounds. The electoral court is going to have a very hard time uh, stripping the president of his mandate with a judicial motion if you have a president with a base of support. And the federal Supreme Court is going to take a certain care to avoid an equilibrium where the institutions come out weakened in a very nasty fight between both branches of government. So I think that there are probably bounds on how, how nasty this this, uh, you know, this crisis is likely to get, at least when it comes to the permanence of the president in office. And when it comes to the potential for an institutional rupture, you know, we can talk about this in Q&A, um, but our assessment is, is that the military will back this administration, and they have been, uh, but at the same time, this is not a military, uh, and the upper echelons of the military that will back the administration no matter what. In other words, this is a crop of leadership in the military that came out of military rule, um, very much of the view that they needed the, the constitutional order. Right. So when it comes to kind of closing institutions of the Supreme Court or Congress, we still think that that's very, very unlikely. Um, probably one of the bigger challenges and questions, at least from a policy point of view, coming out of all this is, okay, if the president doesn't fall and he finishes his mandate, uh, what type of social and economic environment is Brazil going to live in coming out of COVID? And we're going to have a massive social, uh, uh, political, and also fiscal challenges coming out of this environment. Brazil has a very high debt to GDP ratio, around 78% of gross debt to GDP. You know, depending upon the size of the hit to economic growth, which is gonna be significant, uh, Brazil could end 2020 with a debt to GDP ratio of 90 to 100% of GDP. Um, so one of the, the, the larger policy challenges will be uh, in the fall of this year with a headline, uh, let's say drop of GDP, uh, you know, anywhere from minus six to minus 8%, there will be significant pressure in Congress in order to be able to extend the period of exemptions to the constitutional cap on spending from this year to 2021. In other words, the debate will be, how do we dig ourselves out of a massive and historic recession? That's not easy to engage in that debate 
when you have a president fighting for his political life and probably embattled and weakened coming out of the mixture of a deep recession uh, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a COVID um, uh, and public health crisis. And here I would just say, just to, just to leave my comments with one final bet, uh, that we probably will be in, a, in an environment where the concerns of an unhinged fiscal crisis will be at our doorstep. Um, you know, they, this is the, the heart of the currency crisis that we've seen uh, over this past month. It's abated over the past two weeks. But there's one bit of good news, which is when you look at the leadership in Congress, they're probably going to provide some guardrails for how negative this crisis is likely to evolve. Uh, and in speaking with a lot of the party leaders in the Senate and the lower house, an interesting thing that really comes across is this is a congressional leadership that was molded by the previous economic and political crisis of 2015, 2016, that led to the downfall of President Dilma Rousseff. Uh, and for better or worse, the fiscal crisis uh, was at the heart of the economic crisis of confidence that Brazil uh, has lived through. Uh, and a lot of congressional leaders, you know, kind of over the past three to four years, they have increasingly made the link between a fiscal crisis on the one hand with an economic crisis on the other. This led to Congress approving the constitutional reform that le led to a, a cap on spending. This led to a failed attempt of pension reform under Michel Temer and a successful attempt for pension reform uh, for Jair Bolsonaro. And this crop of leadership enters into COVID-19 with the lessons from the previous crisis in mind. What does that mean? It means that this Congress is worried about an unhinged fiscal crisis coming out of COVID-19. And so that, that suggests to me that that while we're gonna probably have a fiscal environment in which the fiscal framework may very well be stretched, um, it'll go beyond what market participants are liking, but at least there is an environment in Congress in order to be able to avoid a complete unhinged uh, crisis of confidence on fiscal accounts. And it's not a coincidence that, uh, that, that we're probably gonna get some kind of grand bargain where more spending on a temporary basis out of, out of COVID-19 for this year and for next year may very well come with some countervailing measures on fiscal reform to be able to control future obligatory spending uh, going forward, right? Uh, so, you know, this is not a, this is not a great environment, um, a highly polarized environment in battle president. Uh, I think that we're, we're headed uh, for a very choppy waters ahead. The institutional tensions have all the elements to deepen over the next couple months. Um, but at the same time, I think that there's some important guardrails in terms of how severe the crisis is likely to go. And I think that the role of Congress will probably be constructive in this environment. But let me end it here, and then we can open it up to Q&A. Uh, Ambassador. I, was, I have been muted. Uh, thank you very much, Chris. Uh, thank you, Ian, for the excellent presentation. It clears very well what we are seeing. Of course, there are lots of questions now, but before proceeding to the question and answers, I think Sergio Fausto would like to make the first question. Sergio. Right, actually, well, first, first of all, always good to listen to Chris and, uh, and Ian. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for, for the invitation and the opportunity to, to co-organize uh, this these event. I have, I have two questions. Um, the, the first one has to do with the striking similarities between Donald Trump and, and Bolsonaro. I don't, I don't need to elaborate more on that. You've, all that you've said point in that direction, striking similarities. Uh, my question is, um, how serious a threat they pose to, to democracy in their respective countries? And I'm, I'm not only concerned about um, short-term impact of their of their behavior right um, Chris has already said that he he thinks that the chances of an institutional uh, uh, rupture here in Brazil the chances are slim but uh, taking a, a, a longer perspective uh, standpoint um, for the first time ever in Brazilian history we have an extreme right group, uh, with uh, deep popular roots. Um, do you see this a threat to, 
to to democracy in the in the long run in Brazil. And the same question to 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 Ian uh, in relation to to the Republican Party. The good uh, the GOP is not uh, the party that we that we knew until until uh, two decades ago. It has changed completely, right? It, it has abandoned the uh, consensus beauty. Uh, is this a, a, a transformation that is here to stay? Uh, and what is the impact of that transformation uh, for the American democracy in the in the long run? This is my my first question. My my second question uh, is for you, Ian, and um, and uh, has to do with uh, in the, the international system uh, in two different scenarios. And one in which uh, Trump is reelected. Trump has been actively promoting the dismantling of the of multilateral institutions, and now a, a China bashing uh, campaign. Uh, probably he would double down on this on this bat if he is reelected. How the world would look like in this in this scenario, and how big a change, how big a difference would a, a Biden's presidency uh, make in this? In this regard, uh, these are my two questions, and and then uh, we have many others to be to be responded by 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 the two of you. Thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, oh. and uh, I, I do have to say, just in the last 15 minutes, I mean, we've got about eight eight more helicopters that are like you can just kind of see them everywhere outside my window here, and it's kind of nuts, but. Uh, you know, if I'm a little distracted, uh, that was that was what that was about. Um, those are two really good questions. Uh, you know, I like Chris. I'm someone that focuses a lot on institutions. I focus less on individuals. Um, you know, I mean, I think that you need to change that up when you're talking about North Korea, when you're talking about Russia, where the institutions are really subservient to the individuals, but where it's the other way around. I mean, there's so many things that Trump has tried to do that he's been stopped, even by his own administration. He really wants a better relationship with Putin, with Russia. He hasn't been able to do it. He hasn't been able to remove sanctions. His own administration has stopped him. Not, over, not only whistleblowers, but just people around him that just aren't up for it. I mean, I think, you know, when you look at what Trump means as a president, and also, in some ways, how similar he is to Bolsonaro, um, there, are, there are several characteristics that Trump has as a president that we, that other presidents have, but Trump has them to a more extreme degree. I think there are three. One is corruption, one is authoritarianism, and one is incompetence. And what's interesting is incompetence is by far the most significant of the three. Everyone's been worried about his authoritarianism, right? And I mean, you know, you would think that in the midst of the worst crisis of my lifetime, this would be the chance for Trump to show that he's really going to take power. He is not interested in taking power because he doesn't want responsibility for anything. He says, no, it's up to the governors. We're not, we're not the ones that are going to make decisions. They have to make decisions. He's a narcissist. It's about him. And there are very few people around him that want to break the existing balance of powers. Maybe Bill Barr, the attorney general, to a, a small degree. Maybe Steve Bannon, his former chief strategist, who was fired. But most of them are just interested in occupying positions of authority and benefiting from the existing system. So, I mean, much more workaday kleptocracy than authoritarianism. So the idea that Trump is going to try to break the system, and it, like Orban in Hungary, for example, or Erdogan in Turkey, and by the way, Orban's succeeding, Erdogan's failing, I think that's a non-starter. Corruption. Trump's corrupt. We know that. He fires the IGs, the inspector generals. He doesn't want oversight. He uses his hotels to make sure they get bailouts and benefits. Um, you know, he, he hires his friends to make millions of dollars off the inauguration. His daughter gets licenses to sell handbags in China. But we're talking about, you know, tens of millions of dollars, maybe, 
for the Trump family. I don't even think it's a hundred million. Now that's a lot of money. You could do well on that money, but this is not Putin style. This is not Latin America style. This isn't India style. This is like, it's Queens. It's where he's from. It's tawdry. It's embarrassing for me as an American because we try to say we have rule of law and then our president flouts it. He promises he's going to display his tax records, but he won't because we know he's done a bunch of illegal shit. But, but that's very different from saying that he's systemically corrupt in a way that threatens the American system. So the authoritarianism doesn't threaten the system and the corruption doesn't threaten the system. It's just ugly. Where the incompetence actually has the potential to threaten the system. It erodes the system more because we've got a big crisis now and Trump just doesn't have the capacity to respond effectively. He abdicates leadership. And when you've got race violence going on across the country and an economic depression that we've just entered and 40 million people that are now unemployed in the last two months, the incompetence of Trump the lack of leadership, his inability to respond effectively, and his inability to listen to experts around him. And that's something that we've seen a fair amount of from Bolsonaro too. I mean, I would argue Bolsonaro at least re uh, respects economic expertise more than Trump does, but I'd be, I'd be interested in Chris talking about that. Uh, but generally speaking, just Trump doesn't, doesn't listen to experts, it's all him. And, and, and that hurts. That's allowed Trump to make a bunch of mistakes. More, more mistakes internationally, and this is the second question you asked, Sergio, about how Trump is more capable of getting involved in a Cold War with the Chinese, but without American allies. I mean, there are lots of reasons to fight China. And by the way, Biden would support most of those reasons, but he would work really hard to ensure that American allies were on board. He supports the Trans-Pacific Partnership, even though Obama couldn't get it done. He wants to get back in the Paris Peace Accord. He wants to get back in the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Agreement. I mean, all of those pieces of international architecture, the World Health Organization, that would help to align the United States with its allies. And if you're about to get into a big fight with China, the second largest economy in the world, and the only country out there with tech firms that can challenge those of the Americans, it would be better if we were fighting with our allies on our side. And Trump is counting on the fact that America is more powerful to force those allies to do what we want. And in the case of Mexico and Canada, you can get them on board on pretty much anything because they have no choice. And in the case of the UK on 5G, you can get Boris on board. But in the case of the Germans and the French and the Philippines and South Korea, it's getting tougher. So. I do think that the G0 is becoming deeper and more fractious and America losing influence internationally to the Chinese who have lots of mistakes that they've made and lots of reasons countries wouldn't want to follow them. Nonetheless, Trump has given them more of an opportunity. And the final thing I will say, because you asked about the difference between Biden and Trump, and obviously there are many differences but one that's interesting is that senior Chinese leaders, when I talk to them, tell me that they would prefer Trump to win a second term than Biden. Senior Chinese leaders. And you may think that's surprising, but it's because the Chinese leadership understands that they're gonna have a tougher relationship with the US no matter what. If it's Biden, the US will be more focused on the Uyghurs and Hong Kong and human rights. If it's Trump, they'll be more focused on East China Sea and Taiwan and the military balance. But either way, there are going to be a lot more challenges between the US and China. But what the Chinese see is that if Trump stays president for another four years, American alliances will be more damaged. He will pull out of more international institutions. He will provide more space and more of a geopolitical opening for the Chinese to play, where if it's Biden, there's much more likely to be a stronger multilateral alignment against China, which they really don't want. And so that's, that's interesting. I, I would say they weren't sure they felt that way six months ago before coronavirus began, but now that it has, they feel pretty strongly about that. Chris. Yeah, no, thanks Ian. I mean, I think that in answering kind of the same question for Brazil, 
you know, in terms of how much does the Bolsonaro administration represent a threat to, threat to democracy, you have to take that question more seriously in the Brazilian context. This is a younger democracy. Uh, institutions are, are not as robust. Uh, this is a government with a very strong military presence. Bolsonaro comes from the military. Uh, he has a, a very senior crop of advisors uh, around him uh, in the presidential palace. You have, you know, you don't have a civilian minister in the presidential palace anymore. Um, and so when you have uh, ministers who have a military background and are generals who are defending this administration, evidently the sensibilities of Brazil's recent political history uh, come come to bear. Uh, but I would, you know, I would argue that when we look at you know, the most important unintended consequences uh, of the institutional landscape coming out of a Bolsonaro administration, I'd probably argue that even though these institutions are under stress, the largest institutional legacy of a Bolsonaro government may very well be a weakening of the executive office in comparison to uh, Congress on the one hand or courts on the other. Because let's look at the political dynamics of this administration. This is a president that got elected campaigning against the establishment, campaigning against judiciary, campaigning against political uh, leaders and party leaders in Congress. He did not generate a congressional coalition uh, in, in Congress to be able to support his administration. He's trying to build one now because he's fighting for his political life. But the response of the other institutions have been to clip the wings of executive prerogatives. Congress approves a constitutional amendment to be able to reduce the, uh, the discretion of the executive office in executing the budget. The Supreme Court has taken a number of decisions to limit uh, executive prerogatives, you know, be it in terms of you know, uh, you know, the, the constitutional role and be able to manage the COVID and, 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 and the lockdown on the one hand, uh, be it in terms of the ability of the president to be able to nominate ministers and, and substitute the head of the federal police, for example. Right? Um, the president is reacting to these overtures very strongly very belligerently uh, in a rhetoric um, uh, which certainly is disconcerting, right? Uh, but, but, but the interesting institutional longer lasting repercussion of all this is an executive office that's weaker, right? In the long run, that may not be a bad thing for Brazilian democracy. Evidently, in the short run, we're gonna go through periods of acute tensions uh, and stress between these institutions. And hopefully we don't have an accident along the way in which the institutional legitimacy of these institutions is, is at play. I think that in the very near term, the larger risk from a legitimacy of institutions is the Supreme Court taking a decision and the president not respecting it. And not being able to, you know, the, the, and the court not being able to, to enforce the decision that they make. That would be a loss for, you know, for the quality of, of kind of, uh, at least of, of the institutions of the of judiciary. But it probably won't come to that because these actors appreciate what, what's at stake here. So, I mean, I think that there is a, um, a level of risk that is, that is larger, but I think the one thing just to, just to flag to everybody is the reason why Brazil generates so many headlines, why the president is so embattled, uh, why he's uh, being investigated by the federal police, by the federal Supreme Court, is because Brazil, in comparison to other emerging market economies, doesn't have as many institutional checks on executive authority. Right? Um, and that's, that's probably a good thing. Um, and so I think that there's a silver lining in all this that, that we're living here. When you look at other political systems, like the Mexican political system. Manuel Lopez Obrador has control of you know, a, a large part of the political system. Nobody opposes him. Right? So there's no, there's no headlines. There's no a, a kind of a, you know, the same type of a stresses that we're seeing in this environment. So there's a, there's a healthy undertone to, to the level of noise and institutional tension that I think has to do with the, with the checks. I think it'll probably outlast this administration. So, uh, uh, Julia, have the questions and answers, please. I can we start? With them. Okay, so thank you all. Uh, well, we have uh, more than uh, 1,000 people connected, so there's many, many questions. It's difficult to select. So, I have a question here that even uh, Ian Bremen mentioned, he loved that question. So, I'll start with that from Antonio Russo. Uh, he asked, Do you think, do you uh, personally believe in American exceptionalism? A lot of people talk about the Iceland and the Sweden models of handling the quarantine. Can you explain a little bit about what happened in these countries? Yeah, Ian. I, I like the question about American exceptionalism because it's something I think about a lot. You know, we call our firm Eurasia Group. Um, 
even though we're a global firm now, because when I started the company in 1998, uh, my expertise was on the former Soviet Union. Uh, I did my PhD, I started in uh, 1989, and what an exciting time, you know, to go to Moscow, to Kiev, to Almaty, these former Soviet republics, as the revolution was beginning, and the country, the empire, fell apart. You know, we beat them. The wall came down, and the Soviet Union collapsed, and Gorbachev ended it. And, and that's, that was, for me, coming of age. And I know that we had a stronger economy, and I know that we, we spent them into the ground militarily, and Ronald Reagan, and Star Wars, and all of that. But, but the fact was that a big reason why we beat the Soviets is because our ideas were better. Um, and we believed in them, and so did they. When I met with all of these young people in the East Bloc countries and in the former Soviet Union, and they, were, and they talked to me about, they wanted to know about our free media, and they wanted to know about our shopping centers. They wanted to know about our elections. They wanted to know how our system worked, our schools, our universities. They wanted to come to America because the country felt like the American dream was real and their own was not. And I think that's really compelling. I think soft power matters. And I think the reason why the institutions we built after 1945, after World War II, ended up supreme is because not just we had the money after World War II, but also because we had the ideas. And we built up not only our former allies, but also the countries we defeated, uh, the Japanese, the Germans, two countries today in the world of all of the major economies, the Japanese and Germans have some of the strongest rule of law. They have some of the strongest commitment to multilateralism. And those are ideals that we helped infuse in them after defeating them in World War II. So that to me is what American exceptionalism is all about. But that was in 1989, 1991, 1998 when I started the firm. You're asking me today in 2020, do I believe in American exceptionalism? And I don't know that I still do. And it's really painful for me to think about. Not because I think the Chinese system is better or that I'd rather live in it. No, that's obviously not true. But rather, you know, as someone who grew up in the projects with, you know, a grandmother that came over, escaped from Syria as an Armenian fleeing genocide to Ellis Island, and, and the country meant everything to her in terms of opportunity. And, and now I look at the kids I grew up with and they're still in the projects and they didn't have those opportunities. And I look at people today in the middle and working class and I look at 20, 25% unemployment, over 10% of which is structural. I look at how much inequality there's been over the last 20, 30 years. And I've done so well and Chris has done so well and yet so many people have watched their income stay flat. It, it doesn't feel like the American dream applies anymore. Uh, and, and when it doesn't, you can understand why a lot of people don't support immigration the way they used to. And how can we plant flags around the world and tell other countries that they need to be like us when not only are our efforts at regime change fail so badly in Iraq and Afghanistan and we give up on these people and we fight them with with drones and with bombs, but we don't actually provide the support for them to develop civil society that they need. But we can't even build a civil society with a social contract that works in America. Now, I don't think our country is broken beyond repair at all. I don't believe that. But I also no longer believe that the American system should be emulated by everyone in the world. I actually think we have to fix. I and mean, the reason why so many young people say that they would rather live in a socialist economy than under free market capitalism is because they look at America and they say, well, if that's free market capitalism, I don't want it. A lot of Americans say they'd rather live in socialism than democracy. And it's not because they don't like democracy, but, but they say that, well, look, if that's democracy in America, I don't want it. It's because our own representative democracy doesn't represent a lot of people. It's been captured. And our own free market capitalism doesn't give most Americans the opportunity to collect capital. And if they have no access to capital, why would they be capitalists? If you think your kids can have no access to capital, why, why would you support a capitalist system? If your elected leaders don't represent you and you think they lie to you, 
why would you support a representative democracy? And that's how we got Trump. And that's how we get Bernie Sanders, how we get people that fundamentally say the system as it is is broken and needs to change. So, so yeah, I, I, I think if I'm being honest with you, I can't call myself an American exceptionalist today, but I can tell you I'd really like to become one again. Um, I'd like to be able to call myself one again. And I do think one of the great things about the American system that makes it still much better than the Chinese system or the Russian system or the Iranian system is that you can ask me that question and I can answer you. And I can answer you publicly and I can answer you on television and I can answer you in a newspaper or on social media and no one can do a goddamn thing to me. And that's not true in authoritarian countries around the world. And actually that's not true in Hungary today, even though it was five, 10 years ago. I think that's important. It's something that we should really cherish. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll ask now two questions together because they are connected. One is from Jose Luis Alcades. Uh, do you believe the military could move to support or impose the uh, resignation of Bolsonaro in benefit of Morão? If political operators convince the Congress, the STF, and public opinion that we uh, we can't accept the incompetence to deal with the problems to come. And another question from Otávio de Barros: In the case of a coup in Brazil, how would the international community concretely react? Uh, what actual impacts would it have in the economy, in particular? Yes. Yeah, I'll. Um... I mean, when it comes to the first question, um, you know, what's the likelihood of the military uh, leadership forcing uh, um, the hand of the president to resign from office so that the vice president can assume? I think it's highly unlikely. I think that the, you know, the uh, the thesis that uh, that the that the president could be guided tutelado by the military is um, is uh, is very hard to envision in practice. Uh, you don't really control a president. Uh, you know, much less a president like uh, Jair Bolsonaro, right? So I, I don't think that the president would accept some kind of inter intervention on, on, on that behalf. Um, you look at kind of the, the sway of the generals in the presidential palace. Yes, they do have some influence. The president does listen to them, uh, but they're not the driving force uh, of policy. Ultimately, I still think that the president is very much uh, in the driver's seat. Um, and if, um, you know, what would be the conditions that the military would would impose such a decision, it would probably be an environment uh, in which you have a, a, a significant public health crisis, a dramatic, more dramatic drop in the president's approval ratings, uh, an unhinged, uh, let's say, financial crisis of confidence. And if we're there, the president will be removed by other means, right? He'll be removed either from motion of impeachment in Congress or from a decision in the electoral tribunal. In other words, the key variable is not whether the president accepts a resignation from the military, it's whether you know, he loses popular support. If that happens, um, then, uh, then the other chips will probably fall along those lines. Ian, did you want to take about the, set, the second question on the international repercussions? Yeah, the, second question. the international repercussions of, remind me, of? It's I, about international repercussions of uh, a coup d'etat in, in Brazil or any kind of institutional rupture in Brazil. I mean, I, specifically the, the economic effects of such an event. Uh, yeah, I'll also add another question connected to that from Decio Doni. Recently, we have witnessed foreign capital leaving Brazil. Do you think this process is, is set to continue? Um, yeah, I mean, I, for, first of all, I mean, I agree strongly with Chris that I think the likelihood of this scenario is so limited that, uh, you know, it's not, it's not something you know, I'd spend a lot of time worrying about. I mean, I, I don't really worry about the U.S. implosion of institutions. I don't worry about Brazilian implosion of institutions. Um, if it were to happen, I will say this is an environment where we're going to see emerging market financial crises. A, a lot of money is going to be required, and the domestic environment, uh, credit's going to become tighter. It's going to be harder to borrow. There's a lot of risk-off behavior. The IMF, the international institutions, are not going to be able to provide what's necessary. A lot of middle-income countries are going to get hit. I'm more worried about a country like Iraq, you know, I mean, given the energy production and where prices are, 
um, and, and the lack of resilience than I am about a country like Brazil. But still, uh, you know, there, there's going to be a lot of pressure. Um, if, if you were to have, in the worst case scenario, a true institutional implosion, um, I, I think that there would be a less international market response to that than there would have been five years ago, 10 years ago. I think the United States in this environment would um, look to try to be transactional in their response. I think the Chinese obviously could care less. They just want to continue to do business as usual. Um, I think the Europeans would be split. I mean, you'd have a lot of hand wringing. You'd have the Germans, for example, uh, worried about human rights. But would you really have the Europeans changing the rule set as a consequence? I don't think so. I mean, this is the thing is you've got a, a G0 implies a lower common denominator for activity. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, look, you've got the Chinese taking over Hong Kong. It's obviously against the law. And you've got the Europeans saying we're not going to impose sanctions, even though the Americans say they are. Why? Because our relationship with China is too important economically. I think you're seeing a lot of that behavior. And I think that that you know aligns with Brazil as much as it does anybody else. Thanks. So a question from Adriana Denur. How do you see the impact of the pandemic on the vast geopolitical project of Belt and Road Initiative, especially regarding the engagement of Latin American countries? So I'll, I'll answer broadly and turn to Chris for Latin America. Um, I mean, Belt and Road, you have the world's poorest countries in particular that most need Chinese investment. Uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, 80% of external debt from Sub-Saharan Africa is held by the Chinese. The Americans are not looking to spend more right now. $3 trillion proposed by Nancy Pelosi for the fourth tranche, not a dollar for foreign aid. Why not? Because there's no political expedience in the US in arguing for more international support. So the Chinese are gonna be holding the bag on a massive amount of infrastructure spending um, with all of the poorest developing countries in the world. But a lot of them are also not gonna be able to service their debt. So, and China has credit bubbles internally. They've got big debt problems with their own corporations. So even though I think these countries are going to be more reliant on China, I think the risk of Belt and Road is actually growing larger. So, I mean, if you ask me long term who you bet on, the United States or Europe, even though American leadership is actually much weaker than it used to be, you still wouldn't bet on China because the dangers both of the domestic instability of China's own economic and credit challenges, as well as the exposure they have through Belt and Road to some of the poorest and uh, least credit worthy investments around the world, that, that's becoming more asymmetrical over time. And, and there's gonna be a lot of backlash. A lot of these countries are not gonna be able to pay and they're gonna push back against the Chinese. The Chinese are gonna have to find a way to restructure all these loans. You've seen some of that happen already. Places like Malaysia, the Philippines, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, you're gonna see a lot more of it in this environment because this is, this is a huge contraction. I mean, you're talking about a global contraction of about 10% of the global economy compared to where it was going to be. And a minimum of three years before you get back to your previous trajectory could be longer than that given political disruptions. And China's gonna be holding the worst of it. I mean, zero growth for one year for China is a lot more problematic in this environment the negative six to negative 8% growth is for the United States for one year. That's just the reality. Chris, you wanna talk about the Latin America implications? Yeah, I mean, I'll just say that, um, you know, the, the relationship of China uh, to, the, you know, to the region, I think was, uh, is something that may very well um, shift coming out of COVID-19. And evidently, Ambassador Castro Navis will, will have, uh, you know, very, very, very good views on this. But what's interesting to note is you look at Brazil's trade balance right now, we're seeing the Brazilian exports to Europe have dropped, to the United States have dropped, to Latin America have dropped. The two areas where Brazilian exports have risen is China and Southeast Asia, right? In, 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 in a context where purchases of agricultural products has actually grown. So you look at kind of you know, China's relative import in Brazil's economy, it may very well you know, be larger coming out of COVID-19 
than it was uh, prior uh, to this crisis. And we're gonna be in an environment in Latin America and in Brazil where government's gonna be desperate for investments and desperate for resources. Um, you know, uh, the interesting kind of conundrum is this, this is occurring in the Brazilian context where some of the ideological views of the administration, which have strong anti-China undertones, are starting to come out now in a way that they haven't come out in the first year of the Bolsonaro administration. It's not a coincidence that in the cabinet meeting that was made public, you know, the video of the cabinet meeting, the only elements of the, of the meeting that were deleted and not made public were references to foreign policy and, and references uh, to the administration's views on China, right, because it could undermine the, the bilateral relationship. So it's almost as if that when the president is embattled, is, is, uh, is turning to his base, um, uh, uh, inflaming the rhetoric, uh, the anti-China sentiment starts to come out with some of his ministers and his sons, but in a context where the economic relationship with China is more important, right? Um, so they'll probably keep that at bay, um, but, uh, but that is a, you know, I would say that China's role in the region tends to grow, but with all the limitations that, that Ian, um, you know, uh, outlined on the Chinese side. Another question here uh, on China uh, from Jackson Snyder from Embraer. Considering the US and China, the complement movements on tech apparently accelerated by COVID outbreak, how deep do you think it will spread and affect the industrial supply chain? Yeah, I, I mean, unlike Belt and Road, you know, Belt and Road, when you build infrastructure, I mean, I'd rather it be built by the Americans. I'd rather it be built by the Europeans. I'd rather it be built by the Brazilians because there's rule of law, um, there's higher standards, and we get the political leverage. But I still would rather the Chinese build infrastructure through Belt and Road than nobody build it because you're actually facilitating development. You're creating wealth. You're creating jobs. Everyone can use a port. I mean, these countries need ports. They need railways. I want them to get built, right? That's a good thing. But when you talk about technology, you know, we're increasingly in an environment where we don't want the Chinese to build digital technology because that'll keep those people in those countries in a zero sum environment off of Western technology. If, if there are going to be two competing data systems, two competing clouds, two competing filters of information and consumer choices, that people on the internet of things will engage with, then the more the Chinese export their, their 5G model and their technology model, the more you will lose those people from interaction with the rest of us, with the West. And, and that's, a, that's a technology cold war. So I, I do think that the supply chain around not only the internet of things, which is much broader than just your cell phone, it's anything with a chip in it. So it's, it's smart houses, it's smart cities, it's driverless cars, you know, it's, it's, but it's also the consumer choices, the data, your bio health, the biometrics, all of these things will suddenly become split into two with one system aligned with Beijing and their super tech companies and another aligned with the West, mostly with American tech companies. That, that's obviously a much worse way to run the global economy. It's less efficient. It leads to more tariffs. It leads to um, uh, companies which will not have access to large numbers of consumers and large numbers of inputs. It's the opposite of what a company like Amazon or Walmart is trying to accomplish around the world. And look, there are problems with the American firms too. I mean, they're under-regulated, they're, they're incipient monopolies, they're not necessarily good for civil society, um, and they, they buy up uh, smaller companies with their own data and market knowledge, and they make anti-competition more significant. They make the barriers to entry higher. But they're still much better than tech companies that provide their data to the government and help to create a technologically empowered surveillance state, which to be fair, is one of the reasons why the Chinese were so effective in being able to quarantine and stop the virus in its tracks. But everything, every other impact on society is much worse. Ask the Uyghurs, ask Hong Kong. 
Um, so I, I do think that we're facing a tipping point in our supply chain going forward. And I think that's a very dangerous thing. A different topic. A uh, question from David Taft, CEO of Siemens, about climate change and the energy transition. What uh, does the debate look like going forward? Um, look, I mean, China's planning on uh, peak uh, carbon usage in terms of fossil fuels in 2040. Um, the Europeans are, are going to have a Green New Deal as part of the stimulus coming out of this crisis. Trump personally is obviously not aligned with fighting climate change. Biden would be vastly more so than any president historically. And even if Trump wins a second term, you've got mayors, you've got governors, and you've got tech CEOs as big winners and fossil fuel companies and real economy as big losers that are moving you towards addressing climate change. So, you know, that plus the financial sector with ESG raking in so much more investment and money I actually, I'm not optimistic about climate because obviously it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. And the G0 means we don't coordinate with the world's largest emitters, the Indians and the Chinese, who need a lot more dirty fossil fuel to continue to be able to grow and satisfy their middle class, which are the largest middle classes in the world. But still, I mean, I would argue that the momentum is overwhelmingly going to be with those that are fighting climate change. And, and of course, this is generational as well, even here in my own country. Uh, and, and I don't think that coronavirus is going to stop that, even though, you know, clearly the money that could be spent on fighting climate change is going to be more constrained in the near future coming out of this depression. So, so I think I'll ask the last question and then, then pass to Ambassador Sasha to... Uh... Make the final comments. Uh, Carlos Braga uh, asks, what kind of global governance will emerge in this context? This con concept now is, a, uh, uh, is there a do still a global governance? Uh, you know, we don't have global governance. Um, we never had strong global governance, but we had a lot more leadership. We now have an environment where the United States has more unilateral influence over many of its allies than it had. And yet the Chinese have the ability to veto and say no. Just in the last 30 minutes, you have the Americans pushing the Chinese on Hong Kong because they're changing the rules. And the Chinese saying, okay, our agriculture firms are gonna stop buying American agriculture according to the phase one deal. That's a pretty big deal. That, that the Chinese have the ability to say no. The Russians don't have the ability to say no, but they have the willingness to cause a lot of problems. The Chinese have the ability to say no. And the Iranians don't, the Mexicans don't, the Canadians don't. If the Americans whack those countries around, they have to deal, but the Chinese do. So that combined with the fact that the Americans are less interested in leading and the Europeans are themselves more divided and weaker than they used to be, Brexit and all the rest. All of that um, is leading to a world that is not going to have global leadership for a long time. This is, I call it a geopolitical recession. It's cyclical. We've just entered into it. It's going to take a long time, probably 10 or 20 years. And it's a G0 world. The G0 world is an absence of global leadership, and it's a world that's much more volatile. The good news is that a lot of the institutions that we created after World War II that don't work well anymore, it becomes obvious they don't work and we need to reform them or create new ones. I mean, if you had to create NATO today, you wouldn't create NATO. You wouldn't create a transatlantic security alliance focused geographically on the Russians and focused thematically on conventional and nuclear weapons. You wouldn't do that. You would create a security alliance focused on Asia, and it would primarily deal with cyber technology and economic and trade issues with some military support as well. It wouldn't look like NATO, but we're stuck because we've got NATO. So the G0 on all of these issues is going to force people to think more about how the institutions are broken, how they don't work, 
how they need to evolve, they need to adapt, they need to be reformed, and in some cases, they need to be broken and started from scratch. And that's the opportunity, that's the challenge. It's going to be a tough time, a crucible, but a crucible that creates rebirth, an opportunity for human beings that won't live in an American world, but they'll live in a world where the Americans are still the most powerful and influential power, and hopefully some of that power can be used for good. Uh, last quick question from Graziele Parente. Has the American dream failed? It's failing. Uh, it hasn't failed. It's failing. I mean, if it was up to me, I would get Cristo, the Italian artist, and I would have him take one of those big orange tarps and just put it around the Statue of Liberty. Don't destroy the Statue of Liberty. Don't take it away. Just, you know, in, because we haven't decided. It's still there, but we don't know if, we, if, if it stands for us anymore, if we stand for it. Give us your tired, your huddled masses. Allow them here. I think we don't know what we stand for right now. So that, that's not to say the American dream is over, but it's to say that right now there's an open question. And, and an open question means we need to answer it better for people, for ourselves. And if we can't answer it for ourselves, then we're not going to answer it for any of you very well. Ambassador. Yeah, well, before concluding, I would like to pose a, uh, a, a final question to, to Ian. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, regarding his last comment, so the Statue of Liberty has become some sort of a sphinx. Decipher or I will eat you. Well, but, but the question is, is the coronavirus a game changer or simply a catalyst of current changes? I think it's an accelerant. Um, it, it's, it's, you're gonna see 10 years of change in 18 months to two years. Structural inequality was already there, it was growing, but it's going to accelerate so much more, deepen so much more because of coronavirus. Racial tensions in the US were already there. They're gonna accelerate so much more. US-China competition tensions were already there. They're gonna accelerate so much more. Technology displacement was already there. It's gonna accelerate so much more sustainability of Europe and questions of the effectiveness of the EU and its integration were already there. It's going to accelerate so much more. So I don't think it's a game changer. It might be a game changer for people that were ignoring these things for the last 10 years. But for those of us, I, I, certainly including you, Mr. Ambassador, um, that have been paying attention to these issues for the last decade, this isn't new. It's just suddenly we have to deal with it. And uh, hopefully that means we'll deal with it effectively. Right. Well, thank you. Well, once again, thank you very much, Ian. Thank you, Chris. Uh, it is. It was an honor and a pleasure and a privilege for us to be able to partake this uh, very good exchange. And uh, I hope that we'll be again together sometime in the near future. Did you see that, Christo? Someone just said Christo died yesterday. Is that true? Yes. Yes, Christo, I, I heard oh on the paper God, today. So much for that idea. Like, I mean, you not only do you not have global leadership, but you don't even have Christo anymore. We are truly screwed. That's quite something. I didn't know that. All right. Okay. Well, on, once again, thank you very much indeed. It was a pleasure for, on behalf of SEBRI, on behalf of CBC, and FHC Foundation, and of course, if you allow me, on behalf of G02, because it's a partnership that we, a very successful partnership, and we hope to be able to repeat it in the near future. Absolutely. Thank you, and thank you all, thank you all for all who have been able to uh, uh, watch this presentation, this debate. Thank you guys. Thank See you very much. Thank you everyone. Thank you.